Welcome back, everybody. We are now on our Unit 2 review. This is Baroque and Rococo. So one of the first things to remember is the term history painting. The system of art education in the Baroque is different from that in the Renaissance. We do still have artists who have workshops. We have their studio assistants and apprentices, but art training is handled largely in the art academies. And so the art academy would not only train artists, but membership in the academy would allow you then to select the upcoming membership. After you achieve your membership, you would then be in charge of who else was allowed into this elite group of artists. Membership in the academy would ensure your success as a professional artist. And the system in the academy was such that there were uh, a hierarchy. There was a hierarchy of projects that were considered worthwhile. And the highest of the academic categories was history painting. History painting has a very strict set of rules. History painting is usually quite large, usually multiple figures, and tells a story. Most often, though, those uh, subjects that are acceptable for that type of painting fall into three big groups. Actual historical events, hence the name history painting, biblical narratives, or mythological. Categories that were less important and the more, uh, the further down the list you go, the less you were going to get paid for these, the less fame you were likely to achieve. Lesser categories included portraits, landscapes, still life, and genre scenes. So history painting was seen as the be all end all. It's what you aspired to make if you were going to be a professional painter. We also have the issue of change on a socio-political level, the change in religion that really changes society in Europe overall. The rise of Protestant faiths has been in place really since Henry VIII uh, decided to create the Church of England in order to be able to practice divorce. We also have Protestant cultures rising in territories that had been controlled by uh, courts that were uh, very heavily Catholic. So the Spanish had control of the lowlands and the provinces, United Provinces, which we now call Holland, broke free from Spanish control in 648. So all of this Protestant um, uprising or change in philosophy, change in culture, became known as the Reformation. They were reforming the church. So the Catholic response to that is the counter-reformation. So some of the things that we'll see in Catholic art of the 1600s is this real need to draw people back to the church, make it make the images of, of biblical narrative more relatable, make the artwork appealing every conceivable way, to draw people in, to make them believe even more strongly, to make them less likely to peel away off into a Protestant faith. So the two time periods are two styles, the Baroque, the Rococo. The word Baroque comes from a Portuguese word, Baroco, which means pearl with a flaw. So the concept is that the art is precious and important, but not as good as the Renaissance. And remember, this is a term applied after the fact by historians evaluating after the fact. So if your ultimate ideal of art is Greco-Roman classical art, then the Renaissance would be the best that the world had ever seen, and anything deviating too much from that might seem not worthy to you. So the Baroque happens immediately after the Renaissance, and the name is applied after the fact. The art of the 1600s, roughly. Rococo is essentially the art of the 1700s, technically from the death of Louis XIV in 1715 until the French Revolution in 1789. So the majority of the 1700s can be classified as the Rococo era. The term Rococo comes from a French word, rocaille, which references the rocks and shells that are used 
in the interior decoration. You can see that as gaudy as Baroque architecture is, it at least has some straight lines and some organization, whereas the Rococo style is more about style than it is about substance. It's hard to tell where the wall stops being wall and starts being ceiling. There's no 90 degree angles. There's no right corners. There's curves and gilding and carving everywhere, and nothing's a rectangle anymore. Everything's a natural looking shape. So the idea of decoration is more in a more important than rationality. So the Baroque comes first, flows right out of the Renaissance, followed by the Rococo. During the Rococo era, we have the rise of salon culture. So in the Baroque, the world is ruled by the courts. And we see that in the bedroom there to the left of Louis XIV, the Sun King. Once Louis is dead, power begins to shift away from the courts and toward still the upper class elite, but the aristocrats outside of the royal family begin to have more power, and specifically women begin to have more power. So in the Rococo, the salon becomes a term that we associate not only with specific rooms like you see to the right but the parties held in those rooms and those parties were an attempt by the hostesses to procure the very best and brightest the edge most talked about most influential people of their day whether that was in the fields of business science specifically of course the arts music any type of celebrity was highly sought out for these events so it really is the idea of culture moving more into the hands still of an elite class but away from just being controlled by the court we also saw a big division between the followers of two important artists peter paul rubens who becomes known essentially as the master of color. And so a lot of the Rococo painters will look to him as their absolute ideal. And Poussin, whose clarity of form and drawing and use of allegorical gestures is going to appeal to people who follow more into the camp of believing that drawing is the most important single aspect of painting. And that will very much influence the neoclassical style. And we'll see quite a bit of that coming up. So the first piece to know for the test is Anibale Karachi's Farnese gallery ceiling, and this gives you an overview shot of the whole thing. Obviously, it is in some respects an homage to what Michelangelo did with the Sistine Chapel, but it's strictly mythological subjects. Generally speaking, proportionally, although the room is not as big as the Sistine Chapel, the size of the paintings relative to the ceiling is much larger. Um, they depict more figures per scene and they are mythological sequences. We also see that Karachi is using the technique of quadro riportato, the technique of a illusion of a framed painting. You can really clearly see that here. It looks as if there's a wooden gilded frame around the thing sitting in front of this medallion, in front of this architectural statuary, and this inexplicably nude man just sitting here. All of those aspects, the nudes, the bronzes, the statues, the architecture, we found in the Sistine Chapel, but now they look even more fully three-dimensional with the illusion added illusion of these quadro riportato frames. We also want to remember the Karachi as being painters who were among the first to found art academies in Europe. Uh, we talk about the idea of the academy. Uh, Anibale Karachi and his brothers helped form the first art academy in Italy. And essentially, again, it is a system for art education. It would rely very heavily on copy masterworks. So you would probably spend the first part of your education making copies of master drawings. If you pass that level, you'd spend the next uh, period working on copies from plaster casts of classical and Renaissance sculptures. And then if you passed that level, you'd be allowed finally to draw and paint from live models. So a lot of really good training and technique, but it did kind of produce a fairly similar appearance in people's style. And it also generated a very rigid belief system about who was allowed into this academic setting. So the artists who had been subjected to academic training 
of course, we're not as open to people challenging the rules and doing things differently. So they tended to accept people who were similar to themselves. They also had a very rigid system of hierarchy of what was considered an acceptable subject. And we've talked about history painting as the highest goal of an academic painter. Caravaggio is by far the most important painter for this particular unit. He is um, the person with the biggest influence across all the cultures that we've looked at. Caravaggio is a, uh, an Italian painter. He very much uses his own unique kind of style. He was not known for doing a ton of drawing first, for painting directly onto surfaces and working things out as he went along, which is a rather unusual uh, approach for this period. He very much used an extreme version of chiaroscuro. He is creating not just a change from light to middle value to dark shadow to make things look round. He's not just using the traditional Renaissance light dark chiaroscuro. He's increased the contrast to an almost extreme level. He's given us super, super, super dark backgrounds where figures fade into the shadows and extremely bright highlights that seem to come in usually from above. So the nickname for this lighting scheme is cellar lighting, as if the light is coming in from a cellar window into a basement um, in a situation where the window would have to be high on the wall. Uh, we also refer to his extreme use of chiaroscuro as the dark manner, or in Italian, tenebroso, or in English, tenebrism. We see here that he is depicting for us the calling of St. Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector who's being called to the faith. And you can see Christ is literally pointing to him in a gesture reminiscent of the figure of God and Adam in the Sistine Chapel creation of Adam panel. But you notice that he is depicted in uh, the robes of the Roman uh, Empire. And we see that on the far left, all of the figures around Matthew are actually dressed in contemporary uh, Baroque clothing, tights and big puffy sleeves and feathered hats. So again, this is counter-reformation. This is trying to make the saints relatable to us. They look like people in our real lives. They are dressed the way people in our real lives are dressed. And so if someone like us could be called to holy service, then perhaps that's something for us to consider in our own lives. It's a way of making sure that we can relate to what's being depicted in the stories. Artemisia Genelaski is an artist very much in the Caravaggio manner, and uh, the artists who are um, imitators or emulators of his style are known as Caravaggesques, the artists who um, paint in a style similar to Caravaggio. The suffix E-S-Q-U-E-esque means similar to or like. So the, these painters are Caravaggio-like. That means they're going to use extremely dark backgrounds, cellar lighting, huge contrast between highlight and shadow, this tenebrism technique. Artemisia Genelaski we definitely remember as an incredibly dramatic personal story. Um, she, of course, was sexually assaulted by her own drawing teacher and had to submit to torture on trial to prove that her statement about his abuse was, in fact, true. So it created a lot of tension in her personal life, and you see that in her artwork. She handles a subject that other artists, including Caravaggio and even Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, had painted before, the beheading of Holofernes by the biblical heroine Judith. In the hands of Artemisia Genelaski, that attack is much more physical, more direct, more personal, and it feels a little even uh, bloodier and more dramatic. And these are all hallmarks of counter-reformation, this appeal to drama, the appeal to the senses, putting things into the painting as if they're spilling right out into your space, are all techniques that Caravaggio used as well. We also see it in architecture. This is a rather unique facade and entrance to the uh, church known as San Carlo of the Four Fountains. And you can see one of the fountains here on the actual corner of the church, and you can see that the entrance is not really square to either of the streets that um, form the intersection that the church is on. It's actually on an odd angle. And the facade, or decorative architectural face of the building, undulates 
moves in and out in a curved fashion. It still has classical order details that we are accustomed to from the Renaissance, but far more organic elements, something unusual that we haven't seen before. As important to sculpture as Caravaggio is to painting is the artist Bernini. This is Bernini's version of the idea of the David. So Michelangelo's David, of course, is depicted older than was traditional, and so is Bernini's. We see him as an adult, very muscular adult. Um, but Michelangelo's version shows David contemplating what he's going to do. He looks ahead to his confrontation with Goliath. He has the rock in his hand and the sling over his shoulder. He hasn't metaphorically loaded the gun yet. But in this case, Bernini's David has the rock in the sling and is in the middle of the action of releasing that uh, weapon to bring his enemy down. So the moment in the story is at the absolute peak of the drama. It is the point of no return. He can't stop. He must proceed with what he's doing. There's no turning back. And yet we don't know the outcome. Remember the early Renaissance versions of the story, we saw David's decapitated, or we saw David rather with his foot on the decapitated head of Goliath. It was after the fact. Michelangelo's version is before the battle, but it's a thinking before. Bernini's is right in the height of the highest rising part of the action. This would be a perfect place for an episode of a TV series end so that the episode ends on a cliffhanger. You don't know the outcome. It increases the drama. So Bernini is also very well known for his dramatic use of poses, of the figure that encourage you to walk all the way around the sculpture and see it from multiple points of view. We know that, of course, that Michelangelo's David is fully in the round, but he was meant to be displayed with his back to the dome of the cathedral. He really has only one ideal point of view. Bernini's David looks great from multiple different angles. It is truly sculpture in the round. Bernini was also a great architect and interior designer, and you see that here in his design for and uh, theatrical setting for this altarpiece. This is a carved marble altarpiece rather than a painting that depicts the uh, Saint Teresa, who was believed to have been carried up to heaven by the announcing angel Gabriel, and when he got her to heaven, he pierced her heart with a flame-tipped arrow, causing her agony and ecstasy. And this is part of the miracles that she was canonized for, it being depicted for us almost as if we're seeing a, a scene take place on a theatrical stage. The donors are in these relief panels on the side, as if they're sitting in opera boxes, this broke, curved, undulating, pedimental decorative device hides a window through which light pours down these golden rods as if the light of heaven is spilling onto these figures. Remarkable. Moving to Spain, we saw a series of Caravaggesque painters doing sort of the Spanish version of Caravaggio's style. Uh, very heavy on the naturalism, on people looking like they came from the real world. There are lots of people who look unwashed. There's lots of dirty feet. People don't look ideal and perfect the way they did in the Renaissance. You see people with all kinds of flaws in these images. This is Ribera's painting, Martyrdom of St. Philip. You also want to know the painting by Zerberon, the Martyrdom of St. Serapion. And in both cases, you can see that the agony and the use of this intense light and shadow has a lot to do with what Caravaggio was all about. The most important painter in Spain, probably as important in some ways as Caravaggio himself, is Velázquez. Velázquez was court painter to the Spanish king, and he was known in the early part of his career for essentially genre scenes like this, what we call a bodejón, or a kitchen piece, a painting that depicts someone cooking in their kitchen, kind of short order cook style. They would open their homes for a, a small fee to cook for neighbors or passersby who needed food quick. That's what's being depicted for you here in Velázquez painting. 
the paintings to note for ID and for essay purposes, though, by Velasquez include Water Carrier of Seville, which somewhat continues Leonardo's uh, tradition of showcasing youth versus age, and in this case, wealth versus working class in the water cellar. Velasquez Philip, the court portrait of the King of Spain, named for the battle that he himself did not participate in, but his troops had just won. We noted this one had what appears at a distance to be incredible delicacy in all of the embroidery and other finery on his clothing. When viewed up close, those are very simple, short, elegant, wispy strokes. It's almost the advent of Impressionism some 200 years ahead of time. Velasquez's masterpiece, though, without question, is Las Meninas from 1656. It is, on the surface, a painting of the Spanish princess. The title implies that the main subject are her ladies-in-waiting, but it also includes a self-portrait by Velasquez. But oddly, if he's painting her, or them, he's in the wrong position. And it's implied that he's painting the painting we're looking at because of the size of the canvas he's facing. In the background, we see his true subject, the mirror reflecting the king and the queen. So it's a painting in which we are somehow standing in the place of the royalty. It is an interactive piece, in a sense. We then turned our attention to the work of Peter Paul Rubens. We looked at several artists from Flanders. So Flanders is the southern portion of the lowlands. The uh, region is going to stay under the influence of the court of Spain and therefore stays Catholic. Uh, we wanted Rubens' uh, elevation of the cross as a good example of his incredible dynamism in this diagonal composition. We see some reference in a way to Caccia with these straining figures that seem to spill into our space, but much more attention to the color. And Rubens is very much um, the master of this idea of reflective color. Some of the blue from the robes seems to reflect into the skin tone. We see some of the red from the in this shadow. There's a sense that all of these colors kind of harmonize together, and he's well known, of course, for his use of red. Overall, as we move forward in time, artists will tend to fall into two big camps for a while, either, uh, painters at least, they will either follow the path of Rubens, who preached that color was the most important aspect of painting, or Poussin, and those would be artists who believe that drawing was the most important element. The other Rubens to know is the allegory for the outbreak of war. Not only did he create these uh, religious altarpiece paintings, but he also created allegorical subjects, mythological subjects. This one is about the goddess Venus, goddess of love, trying to prevent her consort, the god of war, Ares or Mars, from destroying everything. In Rubens' um, personal life, in his uh, professional career, he served as a diplomat, and he did, in fact, try to bring about an end to several European conflicts. So you can see this ending that very much is a propagandistic piece calling out the evils or the dangers of war. He also was known for his painting cycle depicting the, the uh, life of Marie de' Medici. She was an Italian heiress who was then wed to the king of France. So a Flemish painter painting for the French court. She hired him to complete a series of paintings depicting her life and her husband's life, but he passed away before that could be completed. And so the only sequence that we have by Rubens is his paintings of Marie de' Medici. Of that sequence or painting cycle, we want to know this piece, the landing of Marie de' Medici at Marseille. We see her disembarking from a suggestion of the boat. You can see the rigging in the background, but the angle is so low, we don't see much of the boat. We see more of the gangplank as she descends, and we see that mythological gods and goddesses are writhing about in ecstasy at her arrival. Catholic angelic forces are heralding her arrival, and the nation of France itself, an allegorical or symbolic depiction of the entire nation, bows before her. 
One of Ruben's associates is John Bruegel the Elder. He is a descendant of the Bruegel whom we met in the first unit, who of course is known as Peasant Bruegel for his genre scenes. John, Jan Bruegel is sometimes referred to as Velvet Bruegel for these paintings that depict the softer, sensual side of life. He's known for his allegories as well and often painted um, in collaboration with Rubens. This is a Bruegel uh, solo piece, Allegory of Earth, which seems to suggest Garden of Eden in its placement of predator and prey species so closely together. Another artist working for a foreign court is Anthony Van Dyke. He is painting here the English king, Charles I. So having worked in Rubens' workshop in Antwerp and Flanders, now moves across uh, the pond, so to speak, and begins working for the court of Charles I. You can see it's a very different portrait from the one that we saw of the Spanish court of Philip, you see that he's presented still in some finery. He's wearing velvet and satin, and he's got his servants attending him and helping him, but he's also engaging in a leisure activity. He's not dressed with a crown or as a soldier. He's dressed as a person hunting for sport, hunting for pleasure. So it does humanize the king to a degree. Then we moved to our first primarily Protestant culture. When we looked at the section of the lowlands that broke free from the Spanish, when we looked at Holland, we saw a rise of artists interested in subjects other than history painting and making art not just for the absolute aristocratic elite, but for an upwardly mobile middle class. So Claes Heda is a great example of an artist who made a career making paintings to decorate the homes of people who were acquiring new wealth. Now, the Dutch were, of course, known as great traders, and one of the things that was prevalent in the artwork that decorated their homes was showing off some of the wealth they had acquired and the goods they had traded for from around the world, fine glassware, for instance, fruits and vegetables that were not uh, able to be grown in um, abundance in Holland. But the type paintings that I think are most typical of this period are the still life paintings, still life being something other than landscape or portrait. A still life, by its very definition, is meant to show things that are still, things that can't move. So objects on a table is the most common. This is a subcategory of still life known as a vanitas, and it emphasizes the idea of a vain notion. Vanity in this case is the vanity of thinking that we'll be young and vibrant forever. We know, of course, that life will change, that time will change us inevitably. And so a vanitas painting is meant to remind you to enjoy the pleasures of eating and drinking and enjoying life, but not to overindulge because life is brief. So symbols like the broken glass imply change. And certainly fruit that's peeled, that's a will be sweet for that moment and then we'll start to go uh, sour, we'll start to spoil, is absolutely part of what the memento, what the Vanitas tradition is. A lot of Vanitas uh, still life will actually have outright memento mori, literal reminders of death, sometimes things like hourglasses, but more frequently skulls. Franz Halls does a massive uh, is a massive success in terms of his group portraiture. He was making quite a good living off of making portraits, not just of individuals, but in this case of groups of people who worked together. Very popular in Dutch Baroque, these um, sort of social organizations who did good works for their uh, constituents for their cities. What you're seeing here is a female group portrait of the women who run the old men's home in Harlem. So they are maybe a little severe. They don't look like they're having a huge amount of fun necessarily, but they are hard work, working, civic minded, trying to help the elderly and the aged in their culture. Portraiture was one aspect that you could make some money with, but so were genre paintings, scenes of daily life. And Judith Leister was a master of both. She is one of the few female painters um, that we can talk about at, in this era, but there are a lot of female painters in the Dutch tradition. There were female landscape painters and female still life painters in particular. She is probably the best of all the female painters of her of her era. Judith Leister gives us a self-portrait here 
that shows us what she can do and shows us her doing it. It shows her not only uh, painting, but it shows the type of thing that she's capable of. And it's an appeal to the senses, like we've seen so far. This obviously appeals to the sense of music. The big star of the Dutch Baroque, of course, is Rembrandt. So Rembrandt is also known for his group portraits. This is his most famous group portrait of Captain Banning Kopp. It has been called the Night Watch for a long time. It needed cleaning. And once it was cleaned, it was discovered that actually what's happening here is a daytime time scene. We're in a space that's somewhat in shadow between tall buildings, and there's light coming in between the buildings on the cross street here that's showing us clearly that this is daylight. That illuminates, not only draws your eye to the main figure, the captain himself, but also illuminates a figure who's got a dead chicken attached to her belt, which is the symbol, the, the claw is in fact the symbol for this particular uh, male militia company. So it is sort of a symbolic image. We also have a little self-portrait of the artist hidden right there behind the captain. Self-portraits are hugely important for our study of Rembrandt. He painted himself more than any other artist before him. Um, probably an opportunity to study human physiognomy, to, to study how to depict different emotions and different effects with the human face. Not that he was vain, I don't think, but he also really did a remarkable thing with his work. If you look closely at any of the portraits, usually the eye that's closer to you is in not only better focus, but is far more believably detailed than anything else in the image. And as you look at increasingly wider circles around that point of focus, things fade into less and less detail. He's really imitating the specific nature of how your eye actually works, how you look at a specific point and see it in sharp clarity, and how things in your peripheral vision begin to fade. One artist or group of artists that were also successful but did less uh, work with large-scale uh, religious subjects or with large-scale portraits are the so-called Little Dutch Masters, and chief among them is Vermeer. Vermeer was not prolific. He only created about a painting and a half a year during his mature career. It's remarkable how few paintings we actually have from him compared to other artists of his time. But we know that he was meticulous in his replication of detail and observation. Vermeer's The Letter is the piece to know for the test. It depicts a scene as if we are perhaps a servant hiding in a closet looking in on this scene between the mistress of the house and her maid. The implication being that she's just just received a letter with some news that her husband, who's been gone for a while, is about to come home, and that, of course, the maid seems very pleased about this because it will soon be obvious to him that she's been having an affair while he's been away. So you can see the worry on the look of the wife. Moving to France, the French Baroque um, does include some genre scenes and, of course, some religious subjects as well. The One of the artists to know for sure for the religious subjects is Georges de la Tour, and his technique is very similar. You could say he's a Caravagesque. It is very, very dark with intense contrast with the highlight. However, his lighting almost always comes from within the painting as opposed to from a cellar lighting light source inside the frame, and you notice that here with Adoration of the Shepherds, that Joseph's hand is shielding the candle that is shining light onto the Christ child and the rest of the scene. Louis Lanai is known for, and in fact, all of his brothers are known for their genre scenes during the uh, French Baroque. It is a little odd to think that there's this much attention um, on genre in France, but it is uh, the work of members of the Academy. The Lanai family were all founding members of the Academy. Poussin is probably the most important artist for us from French Baroque, and you can really clearly see here his restraint in not overly um, showing histrionic emotion. You can see that all the figures are relatively still. There's not as much movement and rushing about. But if you really look carefully at the expressions and poses, you can see that he is almost telegraphing to you exactly what each person's state of mind is. If you think about the style of acting of 
black and white silent films in which people's facial expressions are very adorated. You get a feeling of that from these faces, particularly this shepherd right here. It's almost impossible to look at the painting and not see that he seems a little distressed. And this gesture shows that he's distressed about what they're investigating. They're all sort of looking in and pointing at this object and the specific area of that object. And this gesture, this hand on the shoulder is a a universally understood symbol for support and reassurance. This figure knows what he's worried about finding out and is trying to reassure him. We call all of these allegorical gestures or allegorical poses. They tell us what the state of mind or emotion or narrative is. It's very clear. What's happening is a scene that's set in a mythological uh, idyllic place known as Arcadia. Arcadia is the state of perfect perfection between human beings and nature. We haven't evolved um, beyond our need to rely on the natural world, but we do have culture, we have clothing, we have language, we have music, we have some architecture, but we don't have massive overbuilding, we haven't dominated the landscape. So these people are in perfect harmony with the natural world and they think nothing will ever change and then these shepherds discover this object they don't understand. It is an above ground tomb and in fact it is inscribed at in arcadia ego which means i am also in arcadia so the implication is that death is also present here in this idyllic scene and so the shepherds are increasingly worried as you read from left to right they're concerned about this and unsure about it and they're being reassured by the female figure who comes to explain and to comfort so clearly this is a kind of heavy-handed moralizing kind of story but you notice that the colors of everybody's clothing the blues the yellows the reds don't reflect much into the skin or into anything else around them. The colors really stay inside their shapes. Those shapes have really hard edges. That's the clarity of drawing that Poussin was known for. Claude Laurent gets his uh, fame really from these incredibly beautiful landscapes, which very frequently have very small narratives in them of biblical or mythological events, making them history paintings, making them more acceptable to the academy. I chose this one because it goes the opposite way. It's just a landscape with peasants and cattle. It's really kind of a remarkable subject to see in the Baroque that we're starting to to see a little break away from uh, this hierarchy of history painting. The perhaps most iconic physical example of what the Baroque is about is the Palace of Versailles. And this would be the view if I used this for an ID or an essay option. This is the rear view, the back of the main palace from the point of view of the gardens. So the Palace of Versailles was initially a hunting lodge when Louis the Fourteenth decided to move his court permanently from Paris to Versailles. The building had to be converted and expanded. That expansion was begun by the architect Louis Laveau and completed by Jules Hondam Massart after Laveau died. The interior decoration was overseen by Charles Lebrun, who is the, also the president of the Art Academy and is the royal court painter. The very largest aspect of the Versailles complex, though, is the formal gardens. Landscape architect Le Nôtre was responsible for those. So as far as the architecture alone is concerned, Laveau and Hardin Massart are the names to associate with this view of the palace. This shows you a portion of the formal gardens. It is by far the largest part of the complex, and it almost seems impossible to believe that some of this territory was swamp before it was drained, leveled, and sculpted into this very controlled version of nature. So the power of the court, the power of the king, could literally transform the landscape and massive architectural, landscape architectural project like this. This building is the prototype, or this landscape rather, is the prototype for the landscape architecture at our own Central Park in New York at the grounds 
of the Vanderbilt estate in Asheville, North Carolina. There are um, implications of this style of landscape architecture in the grounds of the Capitol building in Washington, DC. So this style of outdoor landscape architecture had a massive worldwide impact. The interior is also hugely decorated and controlled. This is the Salon of War. Uh, so again, your architects, Hardin Mansart and Lebrun, Hardin Mansart, Lebrun is the artistic director and Kosivo is the name of the sculptor responsible for these relief statues, not only of the, uh, or relief carvings rather, not only of the king in victory over his fallen enemy, but of the chained with garlands fallen soldiers on either side. The Hall of Mirrors is the other big piece to know from interior of the uh, Palace of Versailles. The Hall of Mirrors connects the war room we just saw with the Salon of Peace, and it has a pretty remarkable feature of these mirrored uh, sections, which are the exact same size and shape and placed directly opposite the actual windows into the gardens, making it as if this room floats kind of in between two natural landscapes. This room, in fact, is where the treaty ending the First World War eventually will be signed. But during Louis's lifetime, it could be used for a number of different purposes, parties, dances, etc. But you can see that even though it is very over the top in its decoration. There's gold gilding everywhere, engaged pilasters, these flattened engaged columns with Corinthian capitals. You can still tell where the ceiling and wall meet architecturally. And the room is essentially a rectangle with a barrel vaulted ceiling. It is, relatively speaking, restrained compared to what's coming next. The other uh, famous sculptor to create works at uh, the complex of Versailles is Pierre Pouchet. This is his Milo of Crotona. It's a mythological story about an athlete whose hand stuck in a tree stump and is devoured by wild animals. Moving to England during the Baroque, the British are much more restrained. Their architecture has less curvaceousness than the Italian style. This is one example to know. It is the banqueting house of the royal family in London by the architect Inigo Jones, and it has alternating round and pointed window detailing, sort of pedimental effect of the windows, as opposed to the grander style of Sir Christopher Wren. Sir Christopher Wren takes the uh, idea of the Italian Renaissance and increases his use of it. We have these uh, double columns, double portico, and double towers on his redesign for St. Paul's Cathedral following the Great Fire in London in 1666. Now we move to the Rococo. The Rococo, again, period following the death of Louis XIV through about 1789, the rise of the French Revolution. So in the Rococo, the French painters, again, are painting less for the court and more for an elite upper ruling class. And so the academy has to adjust to this. And in fact, for Watteau, the author of this piece, they added a new category for the first time in a long time. They added the category of the Fete Galant, which is an elegant outdoor soiree, a party, um, Think of the grandest picnic you've ever seen. They would literally take uh, carpets and carved wooden furniture and tables, and they would eat off of fine china and drink from crystal glasses. It was like all of the elegance you would have indoors, transported by your servants out to some beautiful landscape for a party out of doors. So what those fête galant here actually takes its subject from a successful play of the period. And that play is about the return or the um, coming back from a visit to the island of Scythera. And Scythera is um, a pleasure island. And this comes from the play itself. Come to the island of Scythera on pilgrimage with us. A maiden hardly ever returns from it without a lover or a husband. And so you can see that really the subject of the painting, there's cupids flying all over the place, right? Is really about these couples at three stages of their love affair. You see the stage where they have only eyes for each other, the stage where the man wants to get on with things and the woman is trying to get him to 
linger in this final stage where he's still with her and wants to be with her but wants to get on with things. She looks wistfully back at the joy of the beginning of the relationship. Another uh, Rococo painter from France is Boucher. Boucher was court painter uh, to the lover, the mistress of the king, and decorated her apartments with these erotic paintings, um, sometimes the logical subjects, such as Cupid, a captive, where the women are trying to steal his ability to make people forcibly fall either into love or into hate. Fragonard is perhaps the most scandalous of the painters of this era in some ways. Um, some subjects were considered too risque, um, and when artists were asked to paint some subjects, they said, no, you need Fragonard. So he was known for subjects that would kind of push the envelope of good taste a little bit. And at first glance, this seems to not be offensive at all. There's a, a old fashioned woman in an old fashioned dress and she's in a fancy garden, big deal. But when you look closer, you see that she's with a Sharon who is literally in the dark about the fact that she's intentionally kicking her shoe off so that her boyfriend who's been hiding in the bushes has a little peek up her skirts. It's a terrifyingly forthright, frank painting about this sort of erotic game playing between these two young people. You can even see that the statue of Cupid is in on it. And he's shushing us with a finger to his lips and pointing down so that we don't miss what the subject really is. Also, don't get a, a feeling for any brief moment that this is a real depiction of a real garden, a real tree. It all looks like it's a fantasy that has been painted with meticulous detail. Every leaf is kind of seen as very separate. And the colors aren't particularly natural either. The artists of the Rococo were famous for saying like that nature is too green and badly lit, as if their job was to correct nature itself, make it more beautiful, make it more conform to the will of the artist. Now, the contrast to that, because there usually is one, is the very moralistic painting of the French painter Chardin, who shows us a family that's so pious that before the meal is even served, the youngest daughter knows to pray before eating. This is Grace at Table by Chardin. A court painter from the Rococo, very influential as well, is Louise Elizabeth Vichy Lebrun. She had married into the very family that controlled the art academy, and she became court painter to Marie Antoinette. She was painter to the queen. Um, so she was at the absolute height of her powers. And at this point, again, you see that she is painting, showing you that she, what it is that made her famous. It, she's not only just giving us a self-portrait like we saw with Rembrandt, she's showing us doing what she does and she's showing us the painting as well. Rembrandt had some brushes in his hand, but he wasn't turning a canvas to show us the fruit of his labor the way Vichy Lebrun does or the way Judith Leister did. In the English version of Rococo, we still get some scandalous stories, but they're a little bit more moralizing. Um, with Hogarth's paintings, these, this was done as a painting cycle, and we could use a term that not every art historian uses by any stretch, but a term in quotation marks. They're like painted morality plays. Each chat tells part of the downfall of this family. So it's kind of like watching a soap opera. You get to indulge in watching people do absolutely scandalous behavior, and then you get the satisfaction of watching them have to pay for it by coming to a bad end. So the story here is about two young people who are married. It's a marriage of convenience for their families. Um, he has a title and she has money. The family with money doesn't have an aristocratic title. The family with money doesn't have, uh, the family with a title doesn't have any money left. They've spent it all. So it's a good match, but they don't like each other at all. And it destroys their lives. And so here you see that they are trying, or rather the steward is trying to get pay their bills and do the responsible things. She's been up partying all night. He has just come in from his on the town kind of symbolized by the dog sniffing out the lady's handkerchiefs he's been collecting all night and you can see 
he's already suffering the effects of syphilis. These big black dots on the skin start to denote that there are um, dalliances out of the marriage happening. This is from, again, a series of paintings. It is a painting cycle. We can, um, in quotations, call it softly a painted morality play to differentiate it from the story of the life of Queen uh, Marie the Medici, Queen of France, but we can also look at it as interesting in that what made Hogarth's money were the engravings he made from these paintings, old prints of these images, and it was the sale of those that really made him the money. Here's an example of the engraving from the painting. So an engraving generally is made from a copper plate, a, a thin, flat piece of copper, Every line that you see everywhere you see anything dark is a line that is incised into the copper with a tool called a burn. The plate is covered in ink and then wiped, and that wiping process forces the ink down into the incised lines, wipes it off the areas that are meant to print as white, and then the whole uh, plate is run through a printing press with a piece of dampened paper on top of it. And the reason the paper is damp is so that it's pliable and that will allow the roller of the printing press to squash the paper down into the grooves to pull the ink out. So we can actually make hundreds of impressions or prints from one individual. And that's how Hogarth was distributing this image and making money from it. We also saw some British portraits uh, portrait painters. This is the very proper portrait by Gainsborough. Gainsborough was known for his portraits of upper class clients showing their wealth and power. And here he's showing a very powerful client who is a famous actress, but he is not depicting her as an actress on the stage, but rather as an elegant, well-mannered, high class, well-cultured woman of the, uh, in the most fashionable clothing, with the most aristocratic bearing you could hope for. His sort of competitor is Sir Joshua Reynolds, who painted a portrait of the very same woman, Mrs. Sarah Siddons, but his version shows her as an actress in the act of doing her job. She is performing for us here as the muse of tragedy, the inspiration for drama. We also saw the work of the Italian Rococo painter Canaletto, and Canaletto is best for his paintings of beautiful scenes of cities and locations that people went to really as tourists. During the era of the Rococo and into the next century, we have a tradition known as the Grand Tour, in which people of breeding, people of aristocratic power or of at least upwardly middle class to to upper class people, especially in London, in England, would go on an extended holiday or an extended vacation to tour culturally significant sites throughout Europe, especially in Italy and France, Italy primarily. And this was known as the grand tour. The idea was that well-off, well-to-do, well-educated young people would round out their educations by absorbing the best of art and culture from Italy and from France and bring those ideals home with them to England. And so if you were going to show off your successful grand tour, you might want a painting that commemorated a place that you had been. And that is what the veduta or view painting is. It's a landscape that's really almost used as a souvenir. We also saw the tradition of ceiling painting continue to an extent where it creates the illusion that there is no ceiling anymore. Now we don't have framed panels or fake framed paintings. We now have these illusions that make it look as if there is no ceiling, as if the ceiling of the church just opens up to heaven and souls are carried straight there. That's exactly what's happening here in Tiepolo's apotheosis of the Pisani family. Apotheosis meaning this like, subsuming of the person, elevating them into the heavens. The de Soto in Su term means literally seen from below. And so that is the effect that we have here. Rather than a framed painting that we seem to be looking into or straight ahead at on the ceiling, this makes it look as if we can see the bottoms of the feet, for instance, of this figure as it's rising above us. We see them from below.
We also looked at this remarkable um, example of Rococo uh, altarpiece causes a marble sculpture by the artist Assam, who is Bavarian German. He is uh, creating a fully realized three-dimensional version in a way of the ideas that we saw in the Baroque with Bernini. This is the assumption of the Virgin. This is Virgin Mary being carried bodily up to heaven, similar to the apotheosis scene we just saw. And we can see windows sh uh, shedding light, but we all see that he's created carved clouds. It's almost like the ceiling of this chapel is ripped open. This is the tomb of Mary. The angels are carrying her up from it, and her mourners are just rocked back in uh, astonishment looking at her being carried aloft.